Hey everybody, we're starting chapter four this week. It's a pretty big chapter, so we're breaking it up into two parts. This week, we're going to be talking about the elements, the periodic table, and some of the information that you can get just by looking at the periodic table and knowing about its organization. The next week, we're going to talk about trends on the periodic table, and we're going to talk about electron configurations and a few other things. So this time, we're going to have a little bit of a history lesson that will also give us more information about the model of the atom and how we arrive to the one that we're using today. We're going to start by talking about the elements and their symbols. So if you remember, in chapter three, we talked about pure substances. Pure substances are compounds and elements. The elements are the building blocks for all the things. So everything that's matter is built of elements. You cannot break elements down into anything simpler. If you do that, then you don't have atoms anymore. You have a periodic table if you have the textbook in the front cover of the text. I also have posted in Blackboard a periodic table, and that's the one that you're going to be using if you're going to be taking an exam, let's say, on, um, on Respondus through Blackboard. So with that said, let's get started. Here's a table with some of the elements and their names. The names of elements come from all over the place. Planets, mythological figures, colors, the places where they were first discovered, famous people, like literally everywhere, okay? And each element has a full name along with a symbol. The symbol is what you will see in the periodic table. The chemical symbols represent the names of the elements, and there's either a one letter or a two letter symbol. In either case, the first letter is going to be capitalized. If there are two letters, then the second letter is lowercase. So here are some examples of one letter symbols like carbon and nitrogen, and two letter symbols like cobalt and calcium. Notice how the O for cobalt is lowercase and the A for calcium is lowercase. I'm not going to go through and do these learning checks for you because this one and the one that's coming up right after this, you should be able to do with a periodic table. If you've taken any chemistry before, you've seen a periodic table, you should be able to look up the element name, so like iodine, and find the symbol for it and write it down. So even if you don't do it in your notebook, just make sure that you can do that. You can find the elements based on the name and then know what the symbol is. Likewise, you should be able to look up the symbol and know the element name. So again, I'm not going to go through this, but you should sit down with your periodic table and make sure that you can find the different elements that you need. If you can't, don't be ashamed, let me know. But I'm not gonna take the time to go through and do these two for you. You can do them on your own time and just make sure that you're familiar with your periodic table. Now we're gonna go into the periodic table itself. The periodic table organizes all the elements that we currently know of into groups that have similar properties and we're placing them in order of increasing atomic mass. We're also ordering them in increasing atomic number, which you'll get to know what those different terms mean. On the table, you're going to see columns and you're going to see rows. Those columns are called groups. The rows are called periods. Notice how I wrote group and period. That's a way to remember which is which. The group is the column. The period is the row. Groups contain elements with similar properties. The periods, you're just going across and you're seeing that increase in atomic mass and the increase in atomic number. The periods are also numbered from top to bottom, one to seven. This is a periodic table 
it's got a lot of information on it. You see these different common names here. You've got the period numbers. There's color coding for metals and metalloids and non-metals. So there's a lot of information on here. We're gonna go through and break down what some of these uh, terms mean. And I'll let you know what you need to know for your exam and moving forward, especially if you have to take 105 after this. The first thing we're gonna go over is the group names. So this slide summarizes all the group names and it's a good one to have for your notebook. We're gonna go through each of these group names one by one and talk a little bit more about the characteristics of the elements in these groups. So first we're gonna talk about representative elements versus transition elements. So the representative elements are on either side of the periodic table. So on the far left side and on the far right side. Those are the representative elements. In the middle, you've got your transition elements. You will see on some periodic tables um, group numbers with an A after them. Those are the representative elements. The letter B is used for the transition elements. There's also an alternative system that just numbers the groups from one to 18. You will likely see both on a periodic table. Just know that the letter A is for representative elements and letter B is for transition elements. Now we're gonna talk about the group specifically. So group 1A is known as the alkali metals. This includes lithium and sodium and all these others that you see here. These metals are very, very reactive. They react real crazy if you just put them in some water. You can YouTube it and see videos of this. It's It, it looks pretty cool. I've never done it because it is kind of dangerous, but it looks great. So if you're just looking for something that's got some color and some pizzazz, you can look up alkali metals plus water or something like that on YouTube. Group 2A, so we're just scooting one group over, one column over. We're talking about the alkaline earth metals. Still metals, but they're not as reactive as group 1A. 2A includes all of the following that you see here. There's an element name and you see the element symbols. And like I said, they're still pretty reactive. So strontium is an example of, you know, something that's pretty reactive. And you see strontium in fireworks. So that nice pretty red that you may have seen or heard on the 4th of July, if you live close to where they do fireworks and stuff like that. If you saw red in the sky, it's probably strontium. Now we're gonna skip all the way to group 7A. So now we're on the right-hand side of the periodic table. These are called the halogens. They are highly reactive and they will form a compound with pretty much anything in the periodic table. These are the elements that we're talking about when we're talking about the halogens, okay? Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Very, very, very reactive. Now we're gonna talk about the metals, non-metals, and metalloids. If you remember the periodic table that I showed you, it had the different coloration. The metals are this kind of bluish color here. The metalloids are the green, and the non-metals are yellow. The metals are located on the left-hand side of the periodic table. And to be honest, most of the elements are metals. Large majority. The non-metals are on the far right. So think carbon, oxygen, sulfur, those kinds of things. Those are non-metals. 
the metalloids are the zigzag kind of in between. So they're not exactly metals. They're not exactly non-metals. Let's talk about their characteristics. So metals and non-metals, given the names, you can tell that they're kind of the opposite of each other. You've probably got more experience with understanding just the characteristics of a metal just because we encounter metal all the time. Think about a coin, which I know we don't really use money like that anymore, but you've encountered a penny or a nickel or a quarter or something trying to do laundry and the laundromat doesn't use those cards. You know, you got to go to the quarter machine. All right. So thinking about a quarter or some coin, it's shiny, right? It's solid. You're not going to find, you're not really going to find metals as a liquid except for mercury at, you know, the normal atmospheric pressure and temperature and everything that we live in. In addition to that, metals are ductile. And what that means is they're malleable. So you can bend and shape them into wires. You can extrude them and stuff like that. Metals are also great at conducting heat and electricity. So you may be sitting in your dorm room or in your bedroom or at the library. Well, maybe not the library because I don't think libraries are open right now. But wherever you are listening to this, maybe you're watching it on your phone. You have to charge your phone at some point. You have to charge your laptop. Your desktop computer is plugged in. The lights are on, right? Hopefully. You're using electricity. The wires that are bringing that electricity to your home have copper in them or aluminum. Those are metals. They conduct electricity really well. So those are the generic characteristics of metals. If you can remember metals, non-metals, pretty much just the opposite. Non-metals, think about carbon, okay? Graphite, like pencil lead. It's dull. It's brittle. So when you, when you're trying to write something, sometimes you see that little black dust come off. It's so brittle that instead of really breaking off in big chunks, you're just kind of going to, if you grind it, you're going to get a powder. Non-metals are terrible conductors, but they're usually good at insulating. They have lower densities and lower melting points. And that should make sense. You're not going to see liquid metal. You're not going to melt copper or something like that. Think about the pans that you use on the, on the stove or, you know, the cookie sheet that you're using. Those are made of metals. Those metals are not melting at 300 some odd degrees or 400 some odd degrees or even 500 some odd degrees Fahrenheit. Those are really high melting points. Non-metals, much lower melting points. So if you can remember the characteristics for metals, then you can remember non-metals are the opposite. Now let's address the metalloids. That's that zigzag line that kind of separates the metals and the non-metals. Those exhibit a, a mixture of properties of metals and non-metals. So we can't really give a list of generic properties that metalloids have because they're kind of all over the place. They're usually better conductors than non-metals, but not as good as metals. Oftentimes they're used as semiconductors and as insulators. So metalloids just know that they're a mixture, not quite metal, not quite non-metal, somewhere in between. This table compares specific examples of a metal metalloid and a non-metal. So it gives you descriptions about what it looks like. You know, is it um, malleable? Is it a good conductor, melting points, all those kinds of things. And that will help to put into context what we're talking about with these generic characteristics of metals, non-metals, and metalloids. Now let's link all of these elements to human health. A lot of you are in the nursing program or you might be in psychology. So you really care about human health. 
20 elements are essential for our well-being and survival. Most of our body mass is made up of oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Which sounds crazy. Four elements make up 96% of our body mass. The majority of that body mass is hydrogen and oxygen, which is found in water. So we're mostly water, and then you add in some carbon and some nitrogen to make up the difference. In addition to those elements, we also need what are called macro minerals. So we need calcium, phosphorus, potassium, chlorine, and all these other things because they're involved in really important processes like forming bones and teeth, maintaining your heart and blood vessels, making sure that they're dilated properly, muscle contraction, all kinds of things. And they regulate a lot of different cellular metabolism pathways. So these minerals are very, very important. And you get them mostly from the foods that you eat. You don't have to take a salt supplement. You, um, you may take a calcium supplement depending on your health. But for the most part, you can get these things through the foods that you eat. There are also micro minerals. So those are the ones boxed in purple. These, you don't need a whole lot of them. You can usually get enough from the food that you eat, but you can take supplements. Like for example, if you're anemic, then that means that you have a hard time keeping enough iron in your blood. So you may take a supplement for that, but you don't need a lot. Oftentimes, these metals are used to do chemistry in the body. So the proteins in the body that do chemistry are called enzymes, and they need helpers sometimes to do really complex chemistry. Those helpers are called cofactors, and they usually use metals and things like that to do some really cool chemistry. Now, you're not required to know that, but I'm a biochemist, and it would be terrible of me to not mention enzymes and the fact that they use cofactors, which do really cool chemistry with metals. So there's your health connection. That's why learning about all of these elements is really important. So we've covered the periodic table and some of the major trends in terms of metals and non-metals and things like that, increasing atomic mass. We're getting to talking about increasing atomic number. But now we're going to take a step back and talk about the atom itself. The atom is the smallest particle of an element that still has the characteristics of that element. So if you took some aluminum foil, right? So you had the cookout, you know you're using the aluminum foil to put away the rest of the burgers and dogs, okay? Hot dogs, I call them dogs, burgers and dogs. That aluminum foil contains atoms of aluminum. You can break that down until you have literally one aluminum atom. Once you try to break that atom apart, it's no longer aluminum. We're talking about subatomic particles, and those particles do not have the same characteristics of that element. So let's talk more about what goes into the atom to make these different elements. John Dalton did a lot of work, and he did a lot of observing nature. And from observing nature, he was able to put together an atomic theory. There are five postulates or points to his theory. The first is that atoms are tiny particles of matter. You cannot see them with the naked eye. There's no way that you can just visualize one aluminum atom. Atoms of an element are very similar to each other, but different from those of other elements. So if you have five aluminum atoms, they're all going to be pretty similar. But if you're comparing aluminum atoms to iron atoms, those are different. 
atoms of two or more different elements can combine to form compounds. Remember, compounds are also a pure substance. And so when you combine multiple elements, you make a compound that cannot be physically separated. It has to be chemically separated. And you can take those compounds and rearrange those by using chemistry to form new compounds and new combinations of things. When you're doing those chemical reactions, you can never create or destroy any atoms. You're just rearranging them. So these are the five points that Dalton made in his atomic theory. Let's talk about the subatomic particles within an atom and their charges. You've probably heard this before, so it's okay if you're like, hmm, I'm pretty sure I know that already. That's fine. If you don't, it's cool too. Just make sure that you have all the details. So don't just skip ahead. Make sure that, you know, you know all of the information and you're not just um, assuming that you got it all because you recognize the word proton. So protons have a positive charge, electrons have a negative charge, and neutrons are neutral, which means they have no charge. If you have two positive charges or two negative charges, they're going to repel. Okay, like charges repel. But if you have two opposite charges, or unlike charges, they're going to attract. Now we're going to go back into the history lesson. So we learned about Dalton, and that was like late 1890s or so. J.J. Thompson was doing work, and he is credited with discovering what we now call the electron. He was doing a lot of work with cathode rays, which contain negatively charged particles. Now, you may not be old enough to know about the CRT screens and TVs, but they were really stupid heavy. I mean, like really heavy. You wouldn't want to be trying to lift one of them bad boys if you have a bad back, okay? And we had one when I was a kid. My parents didn't get a flat screen until I was in college. That was when they got all brand new, okay? These cathode rays are, you know, they're used in TVs so that you can get the image that you want to see. Nowadays, we don't use that technology. But J.J. Thompson was doing experiments with these around, you know, in the 1900s or so. And doing that work, he discovered the electron and he also figured out the charge to mass ratio. And he figured out that Electrons are super duper small. He also took that work and proposed a model of the atom. His model is the plum pudding model, where you have protons and electrons just kind of distributed in a cloud, like plums in a pudding. And plums are what we call raisins, okay? I, I don't like raisins, I don't really do pudding. So it's not my thing. But hey, he was relating it to something he knew and the people of the time knew. So I am mad at it. Here's a depiction of his model. So you've got this positive pudding that's just a C of positive charge. And within that C, you've got the plums or the raisins that are the negative electrons. So most of the atom is empty space. And there's no big clunky anything in there. You know, it's just this calm little sea of charge, the positives and negatives hanging out together. Now, J.J. Thompson had a proliferous lab, and his graduate students went on to have their own labs, and one of his students is Ernest Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford, along with another man, you don't have to know this name, uh, Hans Geiger, 
they did what's called the gold foil experiment. They wanted to test whether or not the plum pudding model represented what an actual atom was like. So they put this experiment together. They have a source of really big alpha particles. Alpha particles will pretty much just keep trucking through. So if they hit something that's big, they'll be deflected. But otherwise, they are about their business and they're just going to go straight through whatever it is. So they set up this source of particles so that a beam of it would hit a thin gold foil, hence the name gold foil experiment. If the plum pudding model was true, then you would just see all of the alpha particles going straight through the gold foil. If you had deflection of any particles, that would mean that they hit something. So maybe some of them would go straight through, but some of them would, think, deflect because they hit something. So this one on the left is what you would expect for the plum pudding model. This would be, well, not the plum pudding model. it would suggest that there's something else going on. In this experiment, the particles mostly went straight through the atoms, right? So it went straight through the tin foil, or excuse me, gold foil, not tin foil. But some were deflected, which means that the alpha particles hit something massive enough that changed their direction. What they concluded is that there's some kind of small, dense, positively charged nucleus in the atom that deflects the positive particles. Remember, positive plus positive, you're gonna have some deflection. So between the charge and the size, you know, you have this massive nucleus versus this alpha particle, you're going to have some deflection. So in the center, you have your nucleus. And then around that, in a cloud, you have your electrons. So that's what the gold foil experiment concluded that there's a nucleus. The plum pudding model was wrong. So the structure of the atom, and just to recap, includes a nucleus at the center, and that contains the protons and neutrons, which is most of the mass of an atom. The electrons occupy a large empty space around the nucleus, and that space is defined, and it's um, there's different energy levels and things which we're going to talk about next week for the second part of chapter four. But for now, you just need to know that the electrons occupy the large empty space around the nucleus. Here we're just looking at just the sheer tiny, tiny, tiny sizes of atoms. So the diameter of an atom is around 10 to the minus 10 meters, which is really tiny. And the diameter of the nucleus is 10 to the minus 15. So that's crazy small. And just again, remember, most of that mass is in this nucleus. So in that tiny little diameter is the majority of the mass of an atom. Outside of that, you have the electrons and they just make up the rest of the volume, but they don't really add much to the mass. These particles are so very, very small that we use a special unit for them called atomic mass unit. 
And it's the same thing as Dalton, which you might see or hear in a biology class, where you might hear about the size of a protein being 10 kilodaltons or something like that. Same thing. One atomic mass unit has the mass equivalent to one twelfth of the mass of a carbon 12 atom. And again, electrons are so small that they don't really contribute to the mass of the atom. This table summarizes what we talked about with the subatomic particles. So you have the names of the particles here. Then we have some symbols that you'll need to recognize because I'm gonna start using them as we do problems together, um, not just here in this lecture, but also in the live lectures. So recognize their symbols. Then we have the relative charges, relative masses, which notice how small the electrons are. And then the location, where these subatomic particles are in the atom, whether or not they're in the nucleus or outside of the nucleus. You will not need to memorize the mass of the particles, but you should absolutely know the symbols and the charges and the location of each subatomic particle. Now that we've talked a little bit about the structure of the atom and a little of the history on how we came to the current model of the atom that we use, we can talk more about the periodic table and some of the other information you can glean from it. The first thing we're gonna cover is the atomic number. So if you look at a periodic table, you'll see the symbol. In this case, we're looking at sodium. And above it, you're gonna see a number. That number is the atomic number. It is always a whole number. You will never see a decimal. You will never see a fraction. The atomic number is the same for all atoms of the same element. So using aluminum as our example, it will always have the same number of, it will always have the same atomic number, excuse me. We have sodium here, its atomic number is 11. Every sodium atom will have 11 for its atomic number, which means it has 11 protons in its nucleus. That's all the atomic number is. The atomic number is equal to the number of protons. And like I said already, that number appears above the symbol on the periodic table. Here, I blew up a section of the periodic table, and you can see that as you go from left to right, you are increasing your atomic number. And you're increasing by one. So potassium is 19, calcium is 20, and scanadium is 21. This is another way to visualize the atomic number. So the protons are these red spheres and the neutrons are the white spheres. So the lithium um, atom has three protons, so there's three red spheres. The carbon atom has six protons, so it has six red spheres. So it's just another way to visualize what the atomic number is. For our purposes, we're talking about neutral atoms. And that means that they have a net charge of zero. Because remember, protons are positively charged and electrons are negatively charged. For the atom to be neutral, you have to have the same number of protons as you do electrons. So if aluminum has 13 protons, it has to have 13 electrons to have a net overall charge of zero because you've got 13 positive and 13 negative, okay? So remember, neutral atoms 
the net charge is zero. If you know the number of protons, you also know the number of electrons. Here's a quick learning check that you can do. Use the periodic table to fill in the atomic number, the number of protons, and the number of electrons for each of these elements. I'm not going to fill this in for you. I want you to try it. We're going to do problems like this in class together. So try it out, and if you have questions about it, you can let me know. What you're going to want to do is look up the element on the periodic table using its symbol. The atomic number is going to be located above that symbol, and then knowing the relationship between the atomic number and the protons, protons and electrons, you'll be able to fill in this chart. Another bit of information that's helpful to have is the mass number. The mass number tells you how many particles you have in the nucleus, and it's equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So using our symbols here, protons plus neutrons equals the mass number. It too is always a whole number, so you're not going to see a mass number of 7.5. It's always going to be a whole number. The mass of a single atom is not going to appear on the periodic table. We're going to talk about isotopes in a little bit, and that'll be a little, it'll make things a little bit clearer. So you're not going to see the mass number on the periodic table. You're not going to see the mass of a single atom on the periodic table. What you're going to see is an average. And again, we'll talk about that shortly. This table has the composition of some atoms of different elements. So we're looking at the element, the symbol, the atomic number, which you can get from the periodic table. The mass number is not listed on the periodic table. And then you've got protons, neutrons, and electrons. So this helps to contextualize the concepts that we've been talking about. If nothing else, you should print out this slide or rewrite it in your notes because this summarizes the relationships between the atomic number, protons, neutrons, and that stuff. The number of protons, we said, is the atomic number. That's on the periodic table. The number of protons plus the number of neutrons, again, I'll throw in our symbols here, gives you the mass number, not on the periodic table. The number of neutrons, you can figure out by taking the mass number and subtracting the atomic number. So you will see the mass number as A in some chemistry books, but I don't believe your textbook uses that. The atomic number is sometimes represented as Z. Again, not trying to confuse you, but that's my shorthand for that. So to give you an example, if we have carbon 13, this 13 is the mass number. If you look up carbon, carbon has six protons. Its atomic number is six. So if I wanted to figure out the number of neutrons, I would take the mass number, which is 13, and subtract the atomic number, which is six. And that would give me seven neutrons. Now speaking of mass numbers, we only really talk about them for specific isotopes. So we can distinguish between the different varieties of a particular element. Okay, so we said that the atoms of an element are similar. They're similar but not exactly the same because they may have a different number of neutrons.
And again, we're going to talk about isotopes shortly. Let's do a quick learning check together. So make sure you have your periodic table handy. Pause it, try it, and then check your answer. Let's say you have an atom of lead and it has a mass number of 207. The first question asks, how many protons are in the nucleus? You can't answer that just by looking at the question. You have to use your periodic table. When you look up lead, you will find that its atomic number is 82. That means that it has 82 protons. How many neutrons are in the nucleus? Well, we know if we take the mass number and subtract the atomic number, that we should get the number of neutrons. The mass number we're given in the problem, the number of protons, or the atomic number, we already figured that out from the periodic table. When you do that subtraction, you get 125 neutrons. How many electrons are in the atom? Well, we're talking about a neutral atom here, which means that there's a net charge of zero. So the number of protons that we have, our positive charge, is going to be the same as the number of electrons. So we have to have 82 electrons in order to have a net charge of zero. If you can't do these types of problems, let me know. We're going to do these in class and make sure that you get it. But you will need to be able to do these types of problems, and it will be multiple choice on the exam. Now we're getting to isotopes, as I promised, and we'll also talk about atomic mass. Isotopes are atoms of the same element. So we're going to use magnesium as our example. They have different mass numbers, but they have the same number of protons. So that means that the difference is in the number of neutrons that they have in the nucleus. And we can distinguish them by their atomic symbols. So you have the symbol for the element, the atomic number, and the mass number. The other way that you could see this would be the chemical or the element symbol with a dash followed by the mass number. Or you can see the element name written out followed by the mass number. So those are all ways to represent isotopes of an element. With magnesium, there are three naturally occurring isotopes. The majority of the magnesium that you encounter has a mass number of 24. The rest of the magnesium, which is about 20%, is split up between two isotopes that make up about 20%. So we would write these as Mg24, Mg25, Mg26. But notice on the periodic table, underneath the element symbol, there's a decimal number, and there's only one. That's your atomic mass. And it's actually an average of all of the naturally occurring isotopes, and it takes into account their percent abundance. This table summarizes the isotopes of magnesium. So you could quiz yourself and figure out the number of protons and electrons and all those sorts of things um, based on the different isotopes of magnesium. There's also the mass 
and the percent abundance, which I talked about in the last slide. And those are the two things that you're going to need to know in order to calculate the weighted average for the atomic mass. Before we get to that, let's do a quick learning check to make sure that you understand the concept of isotopes. So we have three different pairs of isotopes here. The first question is asking which pair has this, is the same element. The key to this question is knowing that the same element means the same atomic number. So when you look at your choices A, B, and C, the only one that has the same atomic number is B. Because remember, this bottom number is the atomic number. The second question asks, which pair has atoms that have eight neutrons? You have to know the mass number minus the atomic number is equal to the number of neutrons. And if you go through and do the subtraction for each of these, you will come to the conclusion that C is the only one that has both atoms with eight neutrons. Be sure that you can do both of those questions and that you completely understand it. If you don't, let me know. Here's some more practice for you. So I will fill in the first line and then you can do the other two as practice. The first one is easier and the other two are not hard, but they're just a little bit more challenging. So we have this isotope of oxygen. The first thing we have to fill in is the atomic number. Well, we know that it's this bottom number here. Next is the mass number. That's the number that's on top. P plus, you have to remember that that means a proton. So the number of protons in oxygen is equal to the mass number. Pretty simple, right? N zero, we're talking about neutrons. And that's going to be our mass number minus the atomic number. So there are eight protons and eight neutrons. We're talking about neutral atoms here. So the number of protons has to be equal to the number of electrons. Since we have eight protons, we also have to have eight electrons. So there you go. I filled in the first one. You can fill in the other two and make sure that you understand the relationships between all of these terms. Finally, we're getting to calculating the atomic mass. The atomic mass is a weighted average of all the naturally occurring isotopes. And that number that's below, like I said before, that's the atomic mass on the periodic table. Chlorine is another example. There are two naturally occurring isotopes. Most of the chlorine is going to be chlorine 35, about three quarters of it. And about one quarter is going to be chlorine 37. Notice that the difference is going to be the number of neutrons. When you take into account the atomic mass of each of these isotopes and the percent abundance of each of these isotopes, you can calculate the atomic mass. I think it's better to walk through a sample problem than to talk about how to do it. So here we have gallium. We don't really use CDs anymore, but it's found in the lasers that are used to play um, CDs. So you may still have a CD player in your car, 
but you probably don't use it. In a sample of gallium, we've got 60.10% of gallium-69, and there is its atomic mass. And we have gallium-71 at 39.90% abundance, and we have its atomic mass. And the question is, what is the atomic mass of gallium? Don't get stressed out. It's not going to be that bad. What we have to do is calculate a weighted average. I recommend that you make a table with all this information. You may have more than two isotopes that you need to do, um, that you need to use to calculate the weighted average. And when you make a table, it makes it really, really easy to do the math. In your table, for each isotope, you're going to have a few different columns. We're going to have percent abundance. We're going to have a column that I'm going to skip for now. I'm not going to label it just yet. And you're also going to have your atomic mass. Don't forget that you have units with that. It's AMU. You're going to fill in the information that you have. So for the first isotope, we know our percent abundance is 60.10%. and our atomic mass is 68.926. Fill in the information for the other isotope. Now we'll deal with this column in the middle. This is where I express the percent abundance as a fraction. You can also express it as a decimal, and we can talk about that in class. Your book shows you how to do it as a fraction, so that's what I want to introduce first. But you're essentially doing the same thing whether you do it as a fraction or a decimal. We talked about percentages, and a percentage means that we have part out of a whole, and that whole we always call 100%. So if we were to write this as a fraction, it would be 60.10 over 100. You do that for the other percentage, it would be 39.90 over 100. Now just as a side note, if you add together all of the percent abundances, you should get 100%. If you don't, there is a problem. Now, how do we calculate the atomic mass? What you're going to do is multiply your fraction by your atomic mass. And you're going to add together these two contributions. So I'll rewrite it so that you see what I mean. You're going to take 60.10 over 100 times the 68.926 atomic mass units. That's your contribution from the gallium-69 isotope. You're going to get a number for that, and you're going to add it to the product of this other isotope, 39.90 over 100 times the atomic mass the way that your book is going to want you to do these sig figs let me correct my 
writing here for a second. Sometimes my hand has a mind of its own. You're going to calculate a number for this and calculate a number for this and then add them together. So don't forget your rules of adding and subtracting with sig figs and multiplying and dividing with sig figs. You should get four sig figs um, for your final answer. So the numbers that I got for this part was 41.42 for the contribution from the gallium 69 isotope and 28.30 for the other isotope for a total of 69.72 atomic mass units. We'll do examples of these, but make sure that you can put this into your calculator and get the same answer. That's it for the first part of chapter four. As I said in the beginning, chapter four is a beast. So if I did it all together, we would not be able to do all the questions and things necessary to cover chapter four sufficiently. So we've covered about half of chapter four. We'll cover the rest of it next week. You do have a chapter four check-in for this part one that is due on the 20th. So make sure that you get that done to make sure that you understand the first part of chapter four. All of your mastering chemistry homework and quiz for chapter four will be due the following Sunday on the 27th. Don't wait until the 26th to start doing the chapter four homework and quiz because it's going to take you a while. There's a lot of material. So I would recommend that you go through and do the problems that are related to the content we've covered this week and then finish it up next week and do the quiz. Do not set yourself up because you're going to have a chapter check-in for the second part of chapter four, as well as your master in chemistry homework. So get started early, ask your questions, and then you won't be hating life. I also want to remind you that you're going to have an exam. It's going to be available Wednesday, September 16th at 8 a.m. And it will disappear once we hit 11.59 p.m. on Friday, September 18th. So you have to start your exam before then. It is on Blackboard. Well, it will be on Blackboard. It's going to have its own folder, Exam 1. And it will have the exam, the periodic table, and um, any other information that you'll need to take the exam. Respondents Lockdown Browser and Monitor are required. So I know that some of you have had issues with Respondus Lockdown. Once those issues are resolved, I will let you know. And then you want to make sure that your computer is compatible. Do that as soon as possible. Because if you email me or you send me a message through course messages on Friday night saying, Dr. Hefner, Dr. Hefner, I can't. Save me. I can't. Love you much. Wish you well. Can't save you. So make sure that you figure out whether or not your computer is compatible. You can also use an iPad. As long as you can get Respondus Lockdown Browser downloaded and active, you will be good to go. The exam covers chapters one through three. So chapter four will not be on there. That would be cruel and unusual. Make sure that you're ready. You have three days to take the exam. Do not wait until the last day. If you have an issue, you need to have time to sort it out. That's all I have for you. Do your homework. Keep up. And if you have any questions, feel free to send me a message in Blackboard using course messages. The university is being pretty firm on making sure that student correspondence regarding coursework and courses is through Blackboard. It's a much better way of keeping track of things for me 
because I don't have the clutter of all the other things in my inbox along with your emails. And you will have a much faster response because it's a lot easier for me to sort through and say, oh, okay, this student is emailing me from this course. Because remember, I teach more than one course. So if you email me and say, I need help with the thing on the thing, that's not specific enough. So course messages will keep me grounded in terms of what you need and what class you're in so I can give the information that you need right away. So again, use course messages in Blackboard. Alrighty, y'all. That's enough for now. Um, tune in next week and we'll finish up the beast of a chapter that is chapter four. Until then, see you in class.